From an outsider's perspective, Jordan, are you a spiritual Brexiteer? I have some sympathy with people's desire to disentangle themselves from r rulers who are too far away in the power hierarchy from them. What so, a good point. Why? Well, because as people move away from you up hierarchies, it's harder and harder for them to represent you properly at a local level. And I also have a tremendous amount of faith, I would say, all things considered in, in the people of the UK to muddle through properly because they've been doing that for a very, very long time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'd bet, <laughs> my sense right. as a Canadian is that I'd bet on Britain. Well, some advice from a Canadian, I would say. <laughs> Like, we've, we've just about split our country three times with referenda. And the one thing I would suggest is that it's not a very good way of governing your country. It's like, you can't tell when the damn thing... You can't tell when they're binding. You can't tell when public opinion has shifted enough so that another referendum is necessary. You get endless arguments about whether the wording was appropriate. It's like, you elect representatives to the House of Parliament to make decisions for a reason, and then when you when you turn that decision-making power sort in an arbitrary and unplanned way back to the general populace, I mean, I know they're sovereign and all that, but it's a very bad way of governing the country. And so I think you're in this mess because, well, because David Cameron yeah. abdicated his damn yeah. Can I ask your thoughts on Brexit? Uh, that's, a, that's a question coming from the live chat. Yes, you can have my thoughts on Brexit, Tom. The other day, I was doing a lecture on the, on the stories in Genesis, and one of the stories that I analyzed briefly, and this will be posted very soon, is the story of the Tower of Babel. And I've been very curious about that story. It, it comes after Noah's flood myth in Genesis. And it's a very interesting story. In, what happens is that Human beings get together and they decide to build uh, a massive building. And the human beings that are building the, that building all speak in one voice. And they have this grand vision, which you might regard as a utopian vision, which is what I think it is, that they can build a building so high that within it everyone will speak the same language and it will reach all the way to heaven. And so you could see it in some sense as an attempt to usurp the transcendent. Um, I kind of read it as an, e an early precursor of the story that Milton told in Paradise Lost, where Satan, who's God's highest heavenly angel, and perhaps, and who's Lucifer, the, 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 the brightest light in the psychic hierarchy, you might say, and, and the spirit of untrammeled rationality, decides that he can wage war in heaven and overcome God, overcome the ultimate in the transcendent value. And I read that as a cautionary tale about the pride that goes along with intellectual presupposition and the same pride that produced the totalitarian states of the 20th century. What happens with the Tower of Babel is that human beings start to build this uh, unitary, homogenous structure whose pinnacle will reach into God's heavenly domain, perhaps thereby taking the place of the transcendent. God gets wind of that and goes to earth and takes the people or, or transforms the people who are who are building the building and who, in principle, it would house into a polyglot of people speaking different languages and then scatters them all over the world. Well, what I think that means is that if you try to build a homogenous totalitarian structure that usurps the transcendent, it will begin to badly fragment from within. And I think it's a warning against gigantism. And I think one of the things that's happening in Europe is that we're seeing the folly of the idea of too big to fail. What we're seeing instead uh, is the manifestation of so big it will certainly fail. And I think the reason for that is that there has to be a certain degree of homogeneity within anything that can be categorized as an organization. If the degree of heterogeneity within the organization becomes too extreme, and if the organization becomes too large, then it's very difficult for people to feel any affinity with it. They're going to fragment back into their subsidiary identity groups, and those might be national groups, for example, which seems to be what ha what's happening in Europe. And then the whole thing is going to fall apart. And I have some sympathy for that because I think that it's necessary for human beings at an individual level to feel some sort of affinity for the power structures that they find themselves in. And maybe being one 300 mil one 300 millionth 
of an entity is to be too much of a non-entity to feel any real um, affinity for that structure. So that's part of what I think is happening with regards to Brexit. So. You were talking about Europe being around 300 million people. So why is, why is a group of similar size, which is America, uh, it, it, will it face you think the right and left can talk to each other? Sure. You think they speak the same language? Right, right, right. Right. So, you see that fragmenting occurring. Mm -hmm. And they really are, not only are they speaking different languages, they're, they really are speaking different languages. Yeah. It's the right way of thinking about it. Yes, it's very, very dangerous. You know, I, I think the U.S. worked for a long time, first of all, because it didn't always have 300 million people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people to put under one umbrella. Now, the, the utility of the American system is that it is a hierarchy. Right? There's individuals, families, towns, states underneath a somewhat loose federal structure. And that's sort of, so it's not, a, it's not a monolith where everyone has to speak precisely the same language. It's got some flexibility built into its structure because it's, 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 it's formulated into components which have a certain amount of autonomy. And so far that's worked sufficiently well. Whether it will, con and it'll probably continue to work. I mean, the Americans are a very, very robust people, and they've gone through things that are analogous to what they're going through now many times. God only knows, right? But, but it's a very d dangerous thing to presume that the Americans are down for the count because they have an uncanny ability to rise out from the ashes even stronger than they were before. But you can certainly see the danger lurking. In Europe, that's, that's a different thing. Like, I think the European state is doomed because I think it grew too fast. And it, it severed the connection between, like there's not the proper hierarchy of, of identification. So, and people are saying, wait, I, Brussels? Like who the hell are you guys? Why are you making decisions for us? And we don't agree with your decisions. And like, are you sure that Greece and Germany can be in the same place? Because that's by no means self-evident, right? The Germans aren't very happy about it and the Greeks aren't very happy about it. And one of the rules for making an organization is that it's a lot easier to make a functional organization worse than it is to make a dysfunctional organization better. And so you might say, well, you've got Germany and France and, and England, well, let's say Germany and France, powerhouses, especially Germany, they can afford to bring Greece in. Well, maybe, but there's no evidence that they can afford it. So, I mean, Greece is unbelievably corrupt. No one pays their income tax. That's a big problem, right? And bringing them into a union at a high order has no effect whatsoever on the micro behaviors. And the thing is, the micro behaviors have to be rectified. And no one really knows how to do that. How do you stop a country where people don't pay their taxes from, how do you stop the in, people from not paying their taxes? Why do we pay our taxes? Who knows? We could just all of a sudden decide not to, you know, and the government wouldn't have the resources to run around gathering them all up. For one reason or another, it's become customary for people in functional Western democracies to pay their taxes. But why? Who knows? It would have been way easier for us just to do what the Greeks did and pretend to pay them, you know. So they're too big, I think. And so the people on the right are saying, back to the nation. And like, I understand why they're doing that, but. But the danger is the nation will subordinate the individual. And I do see it as another example of safe spaces. It's just scales different. So, and that's why I think that the proper antidote to that, to both the chaos on the left and the order on the right, roughly speaking, is to walk the proper line in the middle. And we better do that because things are, not, things are too chaotic at the moment. So it's not good. Maybe it's really good, that's possible, but we're in a state where, I really believe we're in a state where things could go any number of ways, and there's no, there's no predicting it. So, and I've never felt that, you know. I, I, I mean, I lived in the 80s, and, you know, political correctness rose up in the 90s as well, and I can remember a lot of what happened in the early 70s with the oil crisis and all that. So, there were times when things were shaky, but they weren't shaky the way they are now. They're an internal shakiness, rather than something that was a threat that was seemed to be imposed from the outside. And that's different. And, and it's, 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 it is associated with, with this intellectual war that's going on with postmodernism and neo-Marxism and all of that as well. <laughs>